Hello everyone, welcome back to another edition of videos. Today I wanted to provide you a simple white opening repertoire to get yourself going. So um, the reason why I wanted to make this video was I've uh, been noticing a lot of my older videos are getting really popular recently. I put that down to uh, some of the lockdown activity that's going on and a lot more people have been getting into the uh, the game of chess, been contacting me around, uh, you know, what, what do I do? What about a white opening repertoire? What are you recommending for that? Um, because I provided a black repertoire, I thought, why not provide a brother to it, the white opening repertoire? And the whole purpose of this guide is just to give you a, uh, a simple opening repertoire to get you, uh, get you started, get you playing. Um, are the openings going to be super crazy positional gambits that involve, you know, five pawn sacrifices and uh, compromising your position? Uh, probably not. But are the openings really theory-based? Uh, again, not really. Um, they are just simple things to do, simple openings to get into and simple structures. Our whole aim with this guide is just to simply get you a good position out of the opening without hopefully getting wiped off the board. So um, I'm going to be um, showing you a little opening repertoire with the move 1e4. Why am I suggesting 1e4? Well, 1e4 is one of the most popular ways of starting the game. Why is that? Well, 1e4 um, does a number of things. It controls the centre in some ways. So it's first you've got pawn on e4 and also controlling the d5 square. It's helping us enable the development of our pieces. So now this bishop can potentially come out. Um, and it's also, because this bishop can come out, it's giving us one, getting us one step closer to castling. And this is another thing that we want to achieve in the opening. Um, so there are, uh, it's, it's a crazy to think, but if you go on the database, um, I've got the Lee Chess database. It seems there looks like I think from the looks of it, 60 million <laughs> different games that have started from this position. Um, so it's clearly it's got it's got, must must be good if 60 million other people have played it. Uh, but certainly even on the master uh, database, I think if I put get that loaded up, I wonder actually if um, D4 is more popular. Let's have a look. Oh no, E4 has won it out by almost 200,000 um, uh, different games have started with 1e4. And it's just the move that makes the most sense in chess. Um, but with that, there are a number of different ways that uh, black can play against this. And I'm not going to show you every single one in this video today. I'm going to focus on just the four most popular ways that black can play against you. Um, I'll hopefully go into a bit more detail in future videos and maybe separate videos around uh, the different ways that, um, that you can handle the position, the different plans. But I'm just going to show you this just to get you started and get you going. Um, now, uh, for those who have understanding of the opening, I'm going to go through some bits on opening principles. If you want to skip this, if you think you're a bit more advanced and you know all these things, just skip it. It's not a problem. I'll put the little timer as to um, where, where to skip to. Um, but for now, for those who have uh, kind of recently come to the game, what is the most important thing in the opening? Well, the most important thing in the opening is to first you want to be controlling these four squares. Why is the center so important? Well, uh, it gen generally it's where our, most of the action happens and it's where our pieces are most active. I'm just going to show you a bit of an extreme example now. Um, let's have a look at this position. So you'll see that these white knights, when they're in the corner of the board, they only control two different squares. However, when they're in the center of the board, you can see with these two black knights here, um, they can tr control up to eight different squares. So generally, it's where our pieces are going to be much more active and much more involved in the game and uh, allows them a lot more flexibility when they're in the center of the board. Um, another thing to consider with the uh, 
with the center is when we when we want to when we control the center it allows us to have much more influence on the game because they're so important because a lot of action goes in if we control it we can control the rest of the board the way I like to think about it to sort of help you remember that the center is so important is just think about this board being like a battlefield and in the middle there is a big hill in the middle ideally you want to be on top of this hill right you want to be controlling the high ground because you can control the rest of the battlefield and the rest of land um, that um, uh, that the, the, the war is being fought on let's say so that's why the center is so important the next thing we want to do is we want to get our pieces activated and I'm highlighting here what are the pieces so these are pieces and the guys in front of them, these are called pawns. Okay, so pawns, we don't really want to make too many pawn moves. The reason why is whenever we move a pawn, we can't move it back. So we're already kind of stuck to moving it, if that makes sense. And it, whenever we move a pawn, it creates a weakness around it and behind it. So um, with that said, I'm not saying we should move any pawns. The reason why we should move pawns is to help enable the development of these pieces. So when we play the move e4, we're actually helping enable the development of our guys now because a few pieces can now come out, but also we're controlling the center as a result. So um, I remember reading a book by uh, Dr. Dr. John Nunn, who uh, was talking about the opening, and he recommends in sort of the first eight, eight even to ten moves, you don't try want to try and not make more than three pawn moves, um, because when we make a pawn move, we're not actually developing a piece; we're just developing a pawn. Um, so we want to try not make too many of these pawn moves and just get our pieces out instead. Um, so development of these pieces so these are really important but there's one piece I want to highlight the Queen so when I watch a lot of beginner games uh, typically they beginners seem to love to get their Queen out really early and in the opening we don't really want to get it out too early I'll show you an example now and this is a, again a bit of an extreme example um, but I just want to show it to sort of give you an illustrative point um, if let's say the game started like this and the queen came out, the problem when we get this queen out too early is now white can develop a piece and gain a te what we like to call a tempo, so a little bit of time. So after c3 we've now got a piece out and we're now attacking the queen. And there are a number of different moves that black can play. This is actually um, a perfectly reasonable defense known as a Scandinavian. Um, but let's say he plays a move bishop to e5. Um, so throwing in a check thinking, oh great, I've got a little check here. The problem here now is after this queen move, we now get another piece developed. And let's say the queen comes to g5, now hitting this pawn. Looks really good. Actually, white can decide if he wants to, to sacrifice this pawn after queen takes on g2 so he's up a pawn which looks really good we can move our rook to g1 and then bish, uh, bish, uh, queen to h3 so really the problem with this although black is up a pawn which you would make consider oh great materially i'm ahead the problem is white has much better development and much more piece activity he's controlling the center he's got way more pieces developed and now this queen really has got a got to find a way to maybe get back uh, home at some point otherwise he can get himself into some serious danger so ideally you know going back to the start we don't want to get these guys out but with the queen we might want to avoid developing uh, her till last so typically what um, what we like to signify at the end of development is something known as connecting the rooks so getting the two rooks uh, communicating and once we've got the rest of these guys, I'll just show you what that looks like uh, just very quickly. Let me just get a position. Um, let's say here. Let's just say everyone getting all their pieces out like this. So uh, after castles, castles. Um, one of the last things that signifies the end of development is moving this queen. So once we move this queen forward after we've castled, you'll see now 
that these two rooks are now communicating. So we've connected the rooks and these allow them to uh, defend each other, get into the center, or even, um, you know, in some positions, we might want to move one rook up known as a rook lift and get a rook behind it and then create like a battering ram in the center and control the position that way. All right, so going back to the start then. So we've already talked about controlling the center, getting our piece of development. The third most important thing in my view is getting the king castled. Um, king safety is vital to any position and castling typically is always a good uh, good move. The only way, the only time it probably wouldn't be a good move is if your opponent's about to checkmate you in one move or is about to unleash a devastating attack against your king. But pretty much 99% of the time, king castling is always a good move. And the reason why is not only does it get your king safe, but it also helps develop this guy. So the rooks at the start of the game are rubbish. They're sat in the corner. They're sat there maybe with a, I don't know, a cigarette in their mouth, chilling out, got their feet out on the uh, the sun lounger um, but they're not doing a whole lot there maybe defending this h2 pawn <laughs> but when we castle we get them into the game so again i'll just show you quickly a quick position so let's say we're getting our pieces out uh, so the bishop comes here now when we castle you'll notice here now that this uh, rook is now become active so our king is nicely safely tucked away but now our rook can come into the position, it can help control the e4 pawn. Another advantage of also castling as well is we spoke about that a lot of activity tends to happen in the center. Um, so I like to call these central files like the, the chess highway or the chess motorway if you're in the UK. Um, so a lot of things happen, loads of action tends to, tends to come down these two files. We don't really want our king stuck in the center here because it can become under attack very, very quickly. When we castle, king's nice and safe, it's out of these central files and it's allowed us to get our rook into play. And I really can't underestimate, you know, castling. I see it so many, so much in my, when I watch beginner games, um, you know, players forgetting to castle or neglecting to castle, and it just gets them into serious danger. You also just need to look at maybe a lot of, um, a lot of old sort of 19th century game, particularly in sort of the romantic era of chess, um, where you've got one side that gets all his pieces developed and the other side forgetting to castle and how they can get absolutely mullered in the opening and some amazing checkmates occurring. So I would really strongly recommend you have a look at those just to see um, some of the problems of not castling in a position. Right, so let's get to the actual point of the video, and that is to help you develop an opening repertoire. So, with e4, we've got a lot of things we've got to prepare against. There are 20 different responses, so they've got all the pawn moves, like so. You've got all the knight moves as well. Um, so I'm just going to just show you on this board here all the different pawn moves, all the knight moves. So in theory, there are 20 different variations we've got to learn, right? Well, you'd maybe be a little bit wrong here because to be honest with you, there's really four moves that black will play. So in theory, you're best to learn against the four most popular lines. And that's going to cover, in my view, about 90% of your opening repertoire. There's no point in learning in huge depth a move like h6, we can just kind of safely say, well, it's not really a great move. Is it controlling the center? No. Is it developing a piece? Not really. So um, in these sort of scenarios, when our opponent plays these crazy things, um, we just want to go back to classical opening principles that I've just shown you. So getting our pieces developed, controlling the center and getting our king castled. We can't really go wrong against these crazy variations as long as we do that. So, so that's that's the first thing I would say about you know if my opponent plays some crazy stuff, just play classically. And even some of the more uncommon openings that um, you could potentially see, just stick to the classical stuff. You should be absolutely fine. So, what is the most 
popular variation that you could see. Well, I'm going to change my uh, database to the Lee Chess database. If you're going by the Master Games database, there is um, a clear favourite in the most popular variation, not C6, it is in fact the move C5, so the Sicilian defence. This has been seen um, from looks at I think over 400,000 times. Um, the other most popular move, and again still very popular in Master Games, 228,000 games in this position, it starts with the move E4, AE5. But if I switch over to the Lee Chess database, there's a slight change, but both are equally as popular. Both have got 20 million different online games that have been played. Um, but what slightly wins out is E5. And I think this is the most popular response. It's the most logical reply. Black also wants a stake in the centre. He wants to get his pieces out and developed as well to their most active square. And he's one move away from castling as well. So e5, we've got to have something against this. Now, um, a slight meander here if we want you can if you want to if you want to play some really risky gambity uh, lines um, do a pawn sacrifice with f4 here if you want to this is known as the king's gambit it's a really risky line there's lots of theory to learn um, because there's I think is about like I don't know, uh, 10 different mainline responses that you've got to know as white against black's different moves so there's lots of things to learn but it can lead to some extremely imbalanced games there's some fantastic games online to spark your uh, imagination um, particularly from the 19th century where everyone started with the king's gambit because um, they all loved it they all just wanted big attacks big sacrifices and all the rest but um it's uh, yeah there's a lot to learn with that and uh, you can do that if you want to if you want a bit more of a aggressive repertoire you can do that another move and definitely one of the most popular moves is playing the uh, the knights to f3 this is the most popular line and it's just a great move this it controls all of the center um, it's uh, attacking this pawn on e5 it just does so many things and whenever we make a move we want to have moves that do many things so I like to call these multi-purpose moves and this is definitely a multi-purpose move it's doing lots of things at once the problem with knight f3 just on a repertoire uh, perspective is there's actually a lot more learning to do now for one we've got to know what to do against knight c6 the most popular line and okay there's um, if you want to go into to the mountains and mountains of theory you can look at both the Italian game and also the Spanish game I mean the Spanish game in particular is just there there are whole like 500 page books that are devoted to these to the Rai Lopez or the Spanish game it is just a mountain of theory to learn um, so you can play that if you want and that's totally up to you. This is, uh, Italian game as well, a little bit less, but it's still actually, I mean, it's, it's more popular on the database. And there are lots and lots and lots of books. The Grandmasters are starting to play Italian game again. Um, it's certainly a very, very good response. But if you, if you don't want that particular life, another thing also that black can play is d6 going into the philidor these are really just stodgy defensive setups and <laughs> quite tough to play against because black is just uh, allowing you to take center but he's just going to have a rock solid opening another way as well the petrov you've got to know against that a really really tough solid opening and um you know this is no wonder actually that um players like fabio caruana who's uh for the second best player he uses this opening uh, to great effect it really neutralizes the position um, extremely well another thing you've also got to prepare for you've got d5 elephant gambit f5 latvian gambit okay these aren't that they're not that pretty dubious to be honest with you but you still got to know what to do against it because uh, black uh, can potentially go for a quick knockout punch with these openings so it can be very very tough so to avoid all of this the whole point of why why I'm showing you f3 is just I want you to avoid all of this and give yourself an easier time and play the move knight to c3 nice and straightforward um, 
the idea of it is we're now protecting this pawn so we stop all the nonsense of the different gambits that black can potentially play and we avoid a ton of theory with this move and there's really only two responses that black can play against us they can play knight to f6 and knight to c6 and both of these are going to go into the exact same position we're going to play knight to f3 then and here black really only has one response knight to f6 and we reach the four knights game this is going to be our standard position this is what we're going to see in you know 90 percent of our games um, this position and what what we need to learn and what we need to do in this particular variation so just very quickly again if you want some a bit more crazier stuff you can play moves like f4 vienna gambit um, and you can play this against both uh, whether knight is played to f6 or c6 first you can play it against both you can also if you want to um, after knight f3 uh, knight comes here there is actually another dynamic choice you can make with d4 this leads into the four knights scotch variation um, very very dynamic opening but there's just a lot of theory to learn and a lot of different responses you've got to look at this just leads to calm symmetrical play but there's still some dangerous ideas so here once you reach the position the move that we want to play here is bishop b5 and i've shown the different plans that black can go into very quickly you might be wondering about bishop c4 and this is also popular um the, uh, it's, it's weird actually that this is actually seen more on the Lee Chess database than Bishop B5 and in my view it's a bit of a mistake because now black can play quite a strong move here and in my view totally equalised position with knight takes on E4 and it's, uh, it sets up a bit of a trap here now because after knight takes you can play the move D5 and you're forking both the bishop and the knight. Um, it's, it's, it's hard to believe it's been played actually quite a lot of time more than bishop b5 um, so that's why we want to avoid playing the bishop there we want to play the bishop to b5 and now we're already creating pressure on this knight this knight is by the way defending this pawn on e5 so in the future we might look at ideas of capturing this knight we don't want to do it straight away in the opening has a few little traps uh, and then we can capture on e5 um, but our main plan is very simple here we're going to castle next move we're going to play the move d3 get our bishop to g5 now pinning this knight to the queen and then we've actually then got a threat with the immediate move knight to d5 so taking advantage of that pin and hopefully creating some uh, pawn structural weaknesses on the king's side Okay, so that's what we do against uh, e5. Going back to the start, the second most popular response is c5, the Sicilian defence. And against this, we're just going to be advocating for the uh, the main line here, knight to f3. Oops. Oh, very quickly, actually, I did forget to mention, if you want a really crazy way of playing against Sicilian, d5 is actually another option. Um, this leads into the smith mora gambo. I play it myself. I really love playing the smith mora It leads to some really fun crazy games um, but as I say the whole point of this opening guide is not to play crazy gambity stuff it's instead just to get you a nice position so knight to f6 uh, knight to f3 sorry and we have really two main responses and against both of these we're going to play the same move so against d6 we're going to be playing the move bishop to b5 and the whole point of this is now black has to respond in some way typically you'll see bishop to d7 and after bishop takes, queen takes, and we castle. We've got a nice straightforward position. We've got an easy plan here. We can, I've, I've illustrated one idea is just playing c3 followed by d4. And we can try in the center that way. Uh, another idea is playing c4 followed by knight to c3. And the whole point of playing this way is we're creating what is known as a Moroxy bind. So just imagine this pawn here and this knight here. So we create a clamp on the d5 square. It makes it very difficult for black to ever really have any central pawn counter uh, counter strikes or count, uh, central breaks because we've essentially closed down the entire center. So that's one way of playing. Um, 
they could also see instead of d6 you can also see knight to c6 and against this again bishop b5 this is actually probably slightly stronger than the last line we looked at because now we've got the threat of potentially capturing this knight and creating a pawn weakness um, so after a move like a6 which is quite a common mistake uh, in beginner chess we captured this knight to b takes uh, or d takes sorry we've uh oh no actually which way we're we doing b takes sorry after b takes this is the the issue we've got um black has created this uh pawn weakness so we've got these double pawns here that i've just highlighted so later on in the position we can potentially use those as targets to hopefully go up a pawn and get a winning position but we've also got this isolated pawn on uh, a6 as well and again this is also a weakness for black we can potentially uh, get our, all our pieces around it and then round it up later on the position but our plan here is really easy we're just going to play castles and our plan is pretty straightforward again we might want to play uh, for um, things like c4, knight coming to c3 and creating that Maroxy bind again, so this really uh, clamping down the d5 square. Or another plan would be maybe to do c3 followed by uh, d4 and again breaking into the center that way and getting our pieces to hopefully good squares as well. Okay, so those are the two most popular things. I would say you probably face these two openings probably 60 to 70% of the time, so probably spend the most time on e, what to do against e5, what to do against c5. The uh, third most popular variation, going back to the start, is what is known as the French defence. Uh, a very respectable line, it can go into a number of different places, and here I'm just going to give you a really simple uh, response to this. After d4 and d5, I'm going to just advocate for just capturing here. It's not the most uh, sharp line, it's not the most um, uh, crazy line, but it just gives us a really simple position. After e takes, this is the problem we've got here. Um, well, the problem for black anyway. We've got, we've achieved a symmetrical calm position uh, and all we want to do here is just get our pieces to good squares so I'll show you an example position um, let me just get let me just get this one up here there we go so you can see I've shown the arrows we're going to get our bishops to these squares um, maybe uh, get the knight to either f3 we can even go to e2 it's probably e2 is a little bit more accurate and we get our king castled nice and straightforward I'll just go through some example lines just so you can see very easy stuff C pawn to c3 as well supporting the d4 pawn that's quite a key move in the exchange and again we've got a nice straightforward position we've got an easy plan here we can move maybe our knight to d2 maybe move the knight to g6 and then get our rooks doubled on the open e file this is where the main battlefield is going to take place is on this open e file okay so that's what to do against the french exchange really straightforward uh, position going back to the start again the final variation that we're going to meet is the Karakhan. Karakhan, very similar ideas here we're preparing c6 preparing the d5 push i should say with the move d6 after d4 oops after d4 um d5 again we're going to capture here i'm just going to advocate for very simple exchange Karakhan. Um, white will have no issues in developing his pieces he's going to get them to good squares once again uh, and castle long play move like c3 to support the d pawn with these two variations though there are there is one other sharp variation you can play in the exchange variation um, but i think this requires a little bit more um, knowledge of some positional ideas so in the french exchange going back to the start um, after you've done the exchange uh, there is an option here of playing c4 here if you want to and um, this is actually scored very well on um, on the master's database the the idea of this is at some point black will capture your c pawn and when he does you've given yourself a an isolated um queen's pawn and these aren't these aren't this is not the worst thing that could happen in your position it's uh, isolated pawns are sort of 
they can either be targets or they can be um, absolute assets in your position. And one of the assets is it gives you a lot of space. Um, it allows your pieces to develop really easily, but also this pawn typically becomes a passer late in the position. Um, so you've actually got almost like a battering ram into black's position to hopefully promote it down at the bottom. The downside of them is it's got no friends to support it. So after, let's say, after after, after a quick capture, you've noticed he's got no comrades who can help defend him. So one of the problems you'll have when you play um, these sort of structures is you want to try and avoid uh, peace exchanges as much as possible because the more pieces that start to come off the weaker this kit, this pawn is going to become and later in the position you know you might see in an end game black might want to round it up once there's less pieces to worry about in the position so you've got the same thing in the Karakhan as well in the exchange variation there is an option to play c4 and this actually is a little bit more powerful than the c4 in the French exchange this is known as the Panoff Botvinnik attack um, and here um, Typically, in a lot of positions, white gets a really good space advantage and actually can launch uh, late in the position really strong uh, king side attacks. So it's something to bear in mind as well. Okay, so that was it for this video. Apologies for it being so long, um, but I just wanted to give you a comprehensive way of playing with one e4 with as simple as uh, developments and uh, getting your pieces out as possible. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope in the future, if this becomes more popular, uh, to maybe um, have a look at some of the more uncommon responses. So things like the Scandinavian, the Alakine, the Piet's Defense, uh, the Modern, maybe in the Nimzovich as well. But as I say, for now, I just wanted to focus on the first four. I'll do some more detailed videos on the first four variations in some future videos. But otherwise, guys, thank you for watching, and I'll speak to you soon. Take care. Bye.